I'm interviewing Bernie Lubell, who is visiting from San Francisco. Bernie and I were in graduate school together many years ago. He's a successful sculptor working in a kind of mixed media domain. We're talking about the process of imagination as it pertains to his work. Generally speaking today, scientific imagination, concerned with cause and effect, is seen as very different from artistic imagination that's much more expressive. A unique aspect of Bernie's work is that he brings both of these, these themes together. So I've asked him to talk to us today about imagination, how it underlies his work, and how it brings the theme of science and the arts together. Please give us a sense for where you're thinking. Well, but when you first uh, brought this idea of imagination up to me, I was thinking, you know, I don't think I have any imagination. I don't think that's relevant to my work. And, um, but I took this is, as a serious assignment uh, from, uh, you know, Professor Kupchik here. So I, um, I started thinking about imagination relative to a project I'm working on right now, and uh, because that at least gives me something concrete to be uh, contemplating. So I've uh, this project I'm working on right now. Um, well, I'll get to it, I guess. Uh, in, Some background. It, yeah, it started. It started with kind of two trains of thought that were uh, going on over uh, almost a decade, but, um, but didn't coalesce with each other until pretty near the end of, uh, of where we are now. So uh, the first was uh, actually was, was thinking about game theory, which uh, I just like the idea of game theory. I like the idea that you can predict behavior with just mathematics, that there's no actual need to uh, talk about people's motivations, their emotions, anything. Their experiences. Their experiences, their history even, mm -hmm. is irrelevant. Um, and I, I mean, I like the idea of this, but uh, never quite rang true to me, but I like, I wanted to see for myself how that might work in a piece that I would make. Mm -hmm. um, prediction, prediction how people would behave in well, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with it, whether I wanted to predict behavior or whether I just wanted to set up a situation that was game theory-like. So the a theme in the background. But I didn't know what I wanted, really. Mm -hmm. I, I, um, and this is true generally of my work. I don't really know what I want until I start working on it. Mm -hmm. And even then, I don't really uh, have any idea until I get close to the end. That's why the titles always come at the end. Uh, because um, they form a little bit of a summation mm -hmm. of, of what I've been doing. Mm -hmm. And so I had this idea of working with game theory. It was kind of based on thinking about Donald Trump in some ways, where Donald Trump acts like he has this paranoid version of what they call a zero-sum game, where if one person wins, then the other person has to be losing. And um, so in uh, Trump's version of this game, uh, if anyone in the world is, un is happy, then he must be losing something. It's a personal affront, so he makes them unhappy, and then that makes him happy because he's winning um, when he's made them unhappy. But, you know, but aside from the irony and the satire of this, uh, I thought, well, there's something interesting here, uh, because, uh, but I didn't know how to make it, make it happen. So I just shelved the idea. And uh, meanwhile, I've been also for, even earlier, been thinking about some kind of interactive beds. And, and, and this was also quite vague. Um, I often start with vague feelings that I'm trying to reproduce somehow for the people who are going to wind up in my piece. Um, so in a sense, I'm, you know, I'm imagining these feelings going on for the people who are going to ultimately be playing with my piece. And you do have a history of creating pieces that are interactive. I do have a history of that. In fact, that's kind of totally what I do. There, mm -hmm. you know, there, I, there always has to be an interactive element, at least since the 1980s anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about uh, these beds, and they were inspired by uh, recovering from heart surgery. I'm in the hospital, and uh, in recovery, they put me on a bed to prevent bed sores. Not that I was planning to be there for very long, but they have these rooms outfitted with expensive stuff. And this bed is moving under me. It feels like there are three or four people underneath me doing something. And it was just an amazing feeling. I felt like, oh, you know, I've got to 
I've got to make a piece that you uses were being a, 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 I, it was it was it was it wasn't really sexy but it was but it was it was really almost creepy in a way it was disconcerting to lie on a bed which you think of as this inert thing that just supports you and here's this bed that seems Things alive underneath me <laughs> you know there's people there or something as if yeah and uh, so I was thinking this would be great. How much do these beds cost? Well, this bed cost a million dollars. So I thought, oh, well, maybe yeah, the home version <laughs> might be a little less expensive. I, looked, I started looking at home versions, but they wouldn't do anything like this. <laughs> Not enough fondling. Yeah, and, and then, you know, then I think only about a couple of years later, uh, my mom was dying at home, and, and we had this cheap home version of one of those beds with alternating pressure to keep her from getting bed sores. And... Uh, and I was, I, it came up again thinking about these beds. And I'm also thinking, well, I'm getting older. I'm going to be spending more and more of my life on beds like this. And uh, might as well make a piece and get Might as well to make a piece it. about of it, out of it. You know, I've already made a piece with a coffin in it. Um, I might as well make a piece with this interactive bed. So, but, but I couldn't figure out how to make the bed interactive. So I started building one. And, um, and this is often true with me. I, I just have to make something before I can, I can visualize how it might work in a piece. And what does that mean by make something? Actually physically I construct I physically it. construct um, a bed and it has to work, you know, in some way. So you say this, this is a mechanical of, bed. Would you say this is an aspect of being a sculptor? You're sort of tinkering and actually physically engaging with? Um, well, it's a, a lot of physical levels to, to what I do, but I, I, but I, I, the making is a physical thing. And, it, uh, and the thing that I make is a real thing, and it's a machine always, in, yes, in always a some way or aspect. another. There's some kind of mechanical aspect to it. And because there's a mechanism there, it, there's, there's a kind of, a, there's a, it's a test. It's not like something I can, it's not a symbol of something. It's not a metaphor for something. It it's a works thing. Or it, doesn't work. it either works or it doesn't work. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's and that's a that that actually. I don't know. I started doing that, you know, it, way long ago when I it, maybe in the late seventies, early eighties. I started making things that had to work. It was just seemed too easy to me to make something that looked good. I wanted something that also had to perform in some way. Mm -hmm. And I liked the idea that it would be something that people could manipulate, you know, people coming to my shows. Mm -hmm. and, and, that, um, and then it gradually became more involving and, and it became something people were in almost, in, in an immersive way. Mm -hmm. They were part of the mechanism when they were working it. And so how did you resolve the bed problem? Well, it, it took a while. <laughs> and. Um, and it didn't really, um, you know, this first bed I made, I couldn't figure out how to get that bed. I, I made a bed that had multiple pads underneath so that how you lay on it and as you moved, different pads would be moving and they would send a signal somewhere, but all mechanically, strings and pulleys. But I, um, but I didn't know um, how to get that to work both ways. If I had two beds... How could they talk to each other this way? They would just be interfering with each other. One might yell louder, as it were, but that didn't seem to be like an interaction. That just seemed to be, you know, like a, like a speech, as it were. So, um, so once again, I kind of forgot about it. And then, uh, at a certain point, I, I don't know, maybe maybe about uh, maybe somewhere around 2013, 14, 15, somewhere in there, I started for some reason, to think about these two things together, this idea of game theory. And because a lot of game theory situations that they set up involve two players. Just they do it, you know, like most things. Game theory, of course, can be much more complicated. But when you're reading a textbook, they start with talking about two players. And reading textbooks about things is about as deep as I get into any of this subject matter. And, uh, so I'm thinking about these sort of two-person game where, uh, and I'm thinking, well, okay, maybe I'll start with something where if one person wins, the other loses, but I want to get something else going on. And for some reason, I think because I just had another piece of surgery and I'm in another hospital room, and I think, you know, I think I'm going to use some beds. I'm going to use two beds. 
And, and now where I got the idea to use inflatable beds, well, I'm not sure, but these beds, they do use air. And I thought, well, I can't make these complicated beds that are moving underneath you in complex ways. I can't, couldn't Too figure out, how, I couldn't figure out how to do that. But I could put air in, in them, like my mom's bed, you know. It would either be inflated or deflated. And, and I figured, okay, so I'll have a, a blower, and, and, I have, and I made a wooden blower, which didn't generate enough air to lift anyone. <laughs> So for the first time in many decades, I started buying commercial, commercially available stuff. And, uh, and, then, and then I wrote it, but anyway, I wrote a grant for it before I, because I didn't have enough money to even do that. So I wrote a grant for it and, and I'd written several other proposals for this piece, some kind of airbags next to each other communicating. And I didn't know what I meant by that any more than that. And I, the, Proposals kept getting rejected. So, but when I connected the game theory idea to it and wrote a proposal for a grant, the grant got accepted. It had an appeal to the people evaluating. Game theory, legitimized floating beds, it's somehow, fighting beds, yeah, fighting yeah. beds. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that people like that. And, and, and I do have a history of making pieces that deal with cooperative and competitive game mm -hmm. games in some level. Even, mm -hmm. even though those are game theory terms, that's kind of why I was interested in doing something that was explicitly about game theory. So it's theory. a frame within which the funders could appreciate the work. Yeah, no, it's, it's true. You know, I, I like to say that a lot of my work has been inspired by, by the ability to take IRS deductions. The tax service <laughs> determined how I made my art. <laughs> Well, because we're honest. yeah, you know, I could oh, I I do carpentry work. Oh, I can take off woodworking machines and I use them for my art too. <laughs> anyway, yep. so how so did that, you resolve? So um, well, it, it it nothing resolves quickly. I'm still working on the piece, but it it is a a, a more than a prototype is out there working now, mm -hmm. and um, and what I what I did was I uh, oh well I got this grant, but I lost my venue that I had set mm -hmm. up for this uh, show. So, so I scrambled another venue and got another venue, but I did not get the funding that the venue was going to give me. So I was, uh, now I'm short of money in my budget. I was going to hire someone to program Arduinos and do this, and the Arduinos would control valves and blowers, and I could get multiple different, just program multiple different interactions between the people to kind of put them in different situations mm -hmm. that would have different kind of outcomes. Mm -hmm. And that sounded great. I didn't know what I meant, but I figured if I would start working with some guy who I was going to pay 10 grand to, to help me figure this out. Uh, but now I didn't have the money. So I back to myself again, and this time I made a little mechanical seesaw. So, you know, one valve's open, the other's closed. And, you know, I put two people on two beds and I gave them strings to pull on. And when you pull on a string, you get more air that blows you up, inflates you, and the other person gets less air and they sink down into the bag. And so um, this seemed okay, but it was, but if you were strong enough, you could overpower the, you know, one person could overpower the other person. I didn't like that idea. It didn't seem like the way fair. I wanted the world to be. <laughs> it <laughs> may be the way the world is. Mm -hmm. It's certainly the way Donald Trump thinks the world is, mm -hmm. but it, it wasn't the way I wanted the world. I wanted that to be lurking there, but not... But overpowering. Not, but not overpowering. That you couldn't... Oh, that even if you were weaker, you could still get into the game. There was hope. Yeah. And um, so... I didn't know, anyway, I didn't like the feel of this thing where it was just like you were, f you were tensed up fighting each other. So I added springs to this network because springs are a, a common trope I use to solve problems. A cushioning trope. Yeah, well, it makes it feel a little bit more like real. It added, adds delay and stretch. And gradual. And, um, yeah. and it completely changed the game because now you, both people could pull really hard and the springs stretch out and they wind up getting the same amount of air. And they both, and they can only pull till the, the springs hit the stops. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't matter how strong you are, mm -hmm. at least hopefully you can't break the apparatus. Mm -hmm. it, it kind of limits you to being equal. So the, the apparatus underlying the game beds 
yeah. has gone through a series of iterations. Yeah, and it's still going through other iterations, but that, but that was the major one. Mm -hmm. because, that, because you could also... You could also talk to your partner in the other bed. Mm -hmm. Cut a can, deal on the pulling. Yeah, you, exactly. You can say, well, wait, wait a minute, you know, you're, what about me? You're not letting me have any air. Oh, okay. You know, so, so the, game, the game changes, you know, now you've got... You've, got, you've introduced dialogue. I, I've introduced dialogue, and it's the dialogue that people come up with, not what I intended mm -hmm. uh, them to do. And um, I've noticed that little kids tend to have less, actually it's not even true, it varies, but some little kids are very aggressive and they just want to win. Adults have tended to be, have tended to be, you know, at least pretend that they're paying attention to they their care. partner. They care. Yeah, and uh, sometimes they, they pretend they're paying attention, but they're just sitting there keeping themselves up and their partner is saying, hey, you know, how about you let go for a while and let's see what happens. So what are the experiences anyway, that people have? Well, I don't, I don't know exactly. And this is what I want to explore more, in more detail. I did show this piece at, uh, at the Exploratorium, which is a science museum in San Francisco. And, and it was interesting, but it was a blitz. It was, I felt like a carnival, Too brief. carnival barker. It, there was just a cue continuously. So I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I, someone, and I had to be there the whole time, which I've changed. I'm adding them mechanisms so people can start it for themselves and they don't need me, but There's, they're also limited in their time. But if someone trained in psychology, you want a little bit of data to get a sense for the variations and the experiences, etc. Exactly, but I'm worried about too much data. So, because too much, if, too much data and it will feel entirely like a, a science experiment, not really like an art piece. And I'm trying to find that that line. Are people laughing? I mean, one of the things. Oh, that people you and, are having a great time. People, are not, you and I have discussed <laughs> whimsy. Oh yeah. As a kind of late motif behind your pieces. So yes, they have a mechanical aspect, and yet they have a game theory aspect. But within the framework of this, we say science that sets up the machinery. People are actually interacting. So and there's can, laughter going on. There's laughter, but you also see differences in the way people relate. It's got personality tests. This person, it, you start it, selling this Bernie, you know, the, the inflatable bed Bernie test. If he's pulling too hard, don't hire him. <laughs> but, or on you know, the other hand. Is, yeah, yeah. And then there's the guys, and there are, it's mostly guys uh, who, you know, who are busy explaining how everything works to their, to their girlfriend or wife. And um, they kill the romance of it. They, well, you know, and, 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 and the wife is trying to could you let go a little while you're talking you know okay that's good this is fun <laughs> yeah so i don't know it becomes sort of a microcosm of uh of, of 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 this of the way people interact with each other you think you would have gotten the contract in the apprentice you never the know apprentice what was this that? was trump's show oh, oh oh right right trump's show. yeah right wow. you pull you win not the other person <laughs> deflates it yeah. sounds pretty well, good the, to me the interesting thing about this is is that letting let sinking down in the bag and letting the bag kind of squeeze you and come up around you is actually just as much of a win, I think, as be floating on top of the airbag. The hidden mommy aspect, a little, it's, little comforting. It, it's, it's kind of, it, it has this, it, it, it's surprising, you know. It, well, it's good for the autism in all of us to get this big squeeze, you know, like that, what's her name, uh, Temple Grandin. Uh, That's right. The, uh, now, yeah. what, one of the things that I've discovered in the conversations I've had with my artist friends is that, for example, in the Tony Sherman video that I did in the first series, he opened up by saying, well, there's no such thing as imagination. Yeah. And when I watch my friend Michael, uh, Gary, and Lanny talking, Lanny Sherrick talking to Lanny's studio about a piece, and I just sit there and watch, they're just focused on the project. So they're not focused on, I'm using my imagination, and look how imaginative I am. That's unspoken. The bottom line is everything's project-oriented. And I'm seeing the same thing here in our conversation. When I said to you at the outset, I said, Bernie, I'm going to be doing this stuff in imagination. I want you to talk about imagination. Well, but imagination just doesn't figure in in a prominent way. It's sort of the theme behind it all. The, the, the being flexible, the trying different ways, the, the different kind of goals, the merger between game theory and social relations. And while you're all trying to work this out mechanically, it has a big social aspect. So standing from the outside, we can say, well, there's imagination in all of it. It's just not what's driving you. 
You're just doing the project. But there are things that are driving me interesting when I started thinking about it more. My first impulse was the same. You know, imagination, there is no imagination. I think I told you this Wallace Stevens story where the poet Wallace Stevens is also an insurance uh, executive. And he calls his assistant into the room. He says, Brownie, what do you think of imagination? And Brownie says, not much. And this always appealed to me, and I never really could figure out why, but, um, but I kind of get it now after having thought about more about how, because there's a kind of, there are things that are, that are nonverbal that for me they're often non-image related too, but they're, but they're, it's about feelings, it's about something emotional, something visceral that I want to have people experience at, in, in the piece right, but as you're they're also, working it. But you're also figuring out how to, to resolve certain mechanical oh, yeah. problems, and the way you resolve the mechanical problems are always interacting with what the person experiences. You point out one yeah. can be a winner, one can be a loser, but it's not too bad to be a loser and enveloped in the bed. You win something also there. Yeah, oh no, all these things, and, and some of these things were not what I expected. I had no idea that being squeezed by the bed was going to be nearly as much fun. Did people as give it, voice to that? They said, oh, that's nice. Oh yeah, well, I mean, I, I was playing with the machines as I was making them too, so I was starting to experience that. And, um, and, and then I had friends over, one of them says, I feel like a hot dog in a bun. <laughs> And I thought, oh, that's a nice image. <laughs> so, where is, the, is there a metaphor in any of this? Because you and I have been talking about metaphor. Yeah. You know, designed a machine is a metaphor, but it seems to come out of what people have to say. Yeah, well, that, I, I, that is the part I haven't savored yet, is uh, because it was really, it was a blitz. I, it was, uh, I mean, every, I gave people two minutes on it. I would set a timer, give them two minutes, and then the, the next group would be there. You know, and there was no downtime in between. But I noticed in your earlier pieces, and, and I participated in one of them in, uh, where were we? we went to see you and you had your show with the swings and the, and the room with two different things happening and the, you know, all the face pressing against the plastic. Oh yeah, and yeah. The rubber. And people just do la spontaneous laughter. So oh yeah. It encourages play, it encourages it a does, kind of yeah. feeling of freedom. Here's an artwork quote, but once you get involved in the artwork, it's a kind of liberating experience. Yeah, well, it, it, it takes people back to being children, in a way, I it think. It encourages play. Be, because the truth be known, <laughs> that's basically, I've been trying to prolong my childhood my entire life. And quite successfully, <laughs> I would say. And, you know, so I'm, ma I'm making toys. <laughs> and how, and how you know, far that, are there further iterations of this, of this artwork, of this work? Well, I'm, I, I did add... I added a surveillance system to it, which um, was not was not so much about the people. It was mostly about the mechanisms that you couldn't see when you're when you're lying in the uh, on the beds or in the beds, uh, um, playing with it. And uh, it was actually great for the Exploratorium, which is a science museum mm -hmm. where people would get to measure. Them. They would get to, well, they would you know they would get to see how everything works because that's you know how does it work? What does it do? This is one of the, the things that that and I and I'm happy to have that happen. But I thought you know I'm demystifying this a little too much. It it it's not that I want to keep it a mystery. I I, I want people. I don't want to be telling people. In other words, you don't What's want to focus on? on the mechanisms inside the bed, yeah. as opposed to letting people just do it and have the experience. Yeah, and then they, they're perfectly welcome to walk around it and figure out how it works. They so can, you can have the experience. Watching the next person. Yeah. yeah, you can have the experience, you can have the science too, but you can also keep them separate to keep the mystery a little, a little ever present. Yeah, I, I, that was kind of what, what I've been thinking, you know, and... Um, so the surveillance, uh, so I'm probably keeping the cameras that are inside the bags. Mm -hmm. I have cameras inside the bags, and those are totally mysterious. For one thing, they're upside down and backwards. So when you're looking, because of how I had to mount them. And what, 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 use, what relevance are the cameras? What are they doing well, for I, you? Well, I, I have a monitor up in front, 
uh -huh. people can look up at this monitor they can watch as they're the lying on the bed. Well, they, they could, but now I'm going to take away most of the science. I'm going to add these more mysterious things that are going on that are part of it that'll just deepen the mystery rather than, than, than revealing the answers. So people can monitor the mystery yeah, without and, monitoring the actual mechanism as a mechanism. And I realized that I could also monitor them with the surveillance system. I can have I cameras. I keep the 21st century Facebook thing. I, I can have the cameras on them and what they're doing don't and how they're the doing it. Don't tell the Chinese. The Chinese don't need any advice from me. <laughs> you know, we, we we were just in China and they we stopped at this uh, five-star public restroom, which was pretty clean. It was a nice, clean public restroom, and um, and uh, when. You know, when we came out, our friend who was taking us around who's Chinese, he was saying, um, uh, he asked Marty if, if, if she had needed toilet paper. And she said, no, I bring it with me in China. I just have toilet paper in my bag because you never can tell. He said, well, no, they, we've taken it out of all the restrooms because people were stealing the toilet paper. And, um, and they made bigger rolls and people stole the bigger rolls. So what they did was they put vending machines in for a very nominal cost. Um, but to keep people from overusing them, they've added facial recognition software. For and the if, vending machines for the toilet paper? For the vending machine <laughs> for the toilet paper. So if you, and if you abuse that, your, this information goes into the national database, which is part of the larger shaming system that China's got going with the national database and this total surveillance system. So we can that one second. So on. there's a potential hybrid here. Yeah. If the person is pulling too hard on the thing, <laughs> there and is. you're revealing the mechanism going on. Bernie can have his own national shaming mechanism <laughs> called the Donald Trump Index. I don't, You're not giving the other person a break. I, I don't like this idea, but it's there. It, the possibility is in this piece. This piece has a lot of possibilities. So one of the things we I see... I think I'm not going to go in that direction. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I, so one of the interesting things I'm seeing here is you began with a certain idea having to do with your own health experiences, your own mother's late life experiences, and the bed theme carrying over also your ongoing theme for how people interact with each other, your concern for game theory, where you have winners or losers and losers, and you brought these themes together that were part of your own life experience in a kind of a machine-based setting, but a machine-based setting that has a lot of social implications because people are interacting around yeah, it. it. And it that does. was a guide for you. Can they interact or are these two beds too removed from each other. That was the thing that kept holding me up from being able to start. I couldn't figure out how to make that happen. But in the end, and just bringing this to a, a conclusion, yeah, yeah, we did, in, in the that. end, uh, this is a very open-ended process. Because as I'm listening to you, you had technical problems to solve with the beds, and then, but if there are, again, there are these opportunities that keep arising, technological opportunities for looking at faces, opportunities for talking about how people feel, giving people a chance to explore. Even the loser can feel enveloped and that can have an upside. So all the, the goods and the bads and the game theory and the mechanism all merge into a kind of unified experience. Well, that, that's the goal. I feel, I feel like I'm just short of that right now. And what's, what, do you feel one thing what, that you'd like to add in the end? It's, I'm, this is going to be my approach, as I'm going to, I have this sort of trope, you know, you don't know what far enough was until you've gone too far, and then you back up, and I do that a lot in my pieces, I go too far, and then I just start editing the stuff that, that is getting in the way emotionally, or So you push the edges, you push the edges, you say, I pushed a little too far, now I can cut back on the piece. So I'm planning to add a, uh, a pre from my psychology experience I'm going to add a kind of a something a kind of a fun questionnaire that's kind of related to tolerance of ambiguity and I'm going to I'm going to give people that ahead of time mm -hmm. and uh, and then I'm going to find some way to collect data on on how they're behaving we have a measure for you we can share and um, but I but then I I got to find a way to 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 bring that back into the art world in some way, so that there'll be, it'll become more poetic than than threatening, mm -hmm. and I, um, and it may be that all those things will be eliminated in the process, and I'll be back to the basic uh, elements of the piece. Or, but I feel that there, it needs more. I, for one thing, I like, I like poking 
fun at the science as much as I believe in the science. So, so I, I, I want to have some kind of meaningless data collection, if you will, but it'll actually collect data that could be useful. In some way, if if you were to collect it in a it in slightly different way, well, well, that I don't think I want to get into that part of it. I mean, I do have a tendency to to do the kitchen sink, as they say. You know, I, I you know, I try to put everything I know into every piece I do, and that that doesn't always that doesn't really always work. I think you know, I, so I'm going to need to go a little bit further, and I got a residency coming up where I'm going to go further. Up at uh, a school in California, I'm going to uh, be there for two weeks playing with professors and students, and we're going to we're going to try some of these things out, and I have access to a shop, and I'm going to keep modifying the piece, and and I'll go too far, and maybe even start the backup, mm -hmm. backing up uh, while I'm up there, now, and Kurt, then I think the piece will be show ready. Yeah. Kurt Danziger, the historian, I, I learned something from him, from him that scientists are basically tinkerers. And now, this is exactly the theme oh, that we're yeah. talking about. We have an artist with a science background being a tinkerer who's tinkering with people's experiences at multiple levels at once. Anyways, I want to thank Bernie Lubell for the chat today, continuing our, our theme of a number of years ago, and there are video materials that will be accompanying this lecture so people can actually see what it's like to be in a bed and steal someone else's air. Right, and but you know it's all for a good cause. All for a good cause. Thank you very much, Bernie. <laughs> Thanks, Jerry. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks very much.